Now, the question is, uh, is that really impossible of the sort that is absolutely rigorously true, or have you made some assumption? And it turns out you have made some assumption in the second kind of impossible. What I always pay attention to is whenever someone tells you that something is impossible. So, you know, sometimes when a scientist says something is impossible, there are really solid reasons why it is impossible. It's, it's absolutely violating something that we know to be true, uh, that we can prove is true, and um, there's no loopholes around it. So um, an, an example of that is if I were to give you a bunch of, let's say, squares and asked you to tile your floor with squares, you know you could do it and fill the floor without any gaps. But if I gave you a bunch of perfect pentagons, regular pentagons, that's mathematically impossible. You cannot fill the floor with pentagons without ha having spaces between them. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes when scientists say something imp is impossible, they're saying it's impossible based on some assumptions that they're making that maybe they're not even aware of. They're, they're so common and so, uh, so apparently true that they just take it for granted and then they reach a conclusion from that. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the things that we've known in science for centuries is that atoms and molecules like to come together just like tiles. And so if you, that is to say crystals, for example, are form building blocks similar to tiles, which just join together, you know, edge to edge to fill a solid and make the crystal. And we know that accounts for many of the properties of crystals, including the way they facet and form those nice, beautiful facets that we're all familiar with and that we find attractive. And um, it also affects a lot of their electronic and physical properties. And so for a long time, we believed just like we can put squares together to make tiles, we can put atoms and molecules together to make crystals, but there are certain shapes which are absolutely forbidden. For example, you cannot have any form of matter which has facets which have perfect pentagon shapes for basically the same reason that you cannot tile a floor with perfect pentagons. And that was an absolute rigorous law of matter uh, that um, everyone learned when who studied matter for the last several hundred years. Uh, now, the question is, uh, is that really impossible of the sort that is absolutely rigorously true, or have you made some assumption? And it turns out you have made some assumption in the second kind of impossible. Um, you've made an assumption that uh, matter only can form a single kind of building block, just like a single pentagon or a single square. Another logical possibility, once you think about it, is that suppose matter forms, let's say, two different kinds of building blocks, two different shapes, and they don't repeat edge to edge, you know, one after the other, but they repeat in a complicated sequence with sort of two different frequencies at two different sets of intervals. Turns out you can then make something new that people hadn't considered before called a quasi-crystal, a new form of material. And so while it was thought to be impossible to have any material with five full facets, that turns out to be the second kind of impossible, the kind of impossible that was based on an assumption that turns out not to be true. Matter doesn't have to form that way, uh, and it can form, therefore, all kinds of new shapes that we thought were mathematically forbidden. And it's not just one shape, not just, I'm just focusing on the pentagons because those are the first examples found. But before the discovery of quasi-crystals, there was really only a small number of different possible patterns that we thought matter could make. We discovered that we were missing an infinite number of possibilities. And we've only discovered a few new possibilities so far, but we know that they're beginning, that's the beginning of a, an unbounded set of new, new shapes and possibilities. So they are the example of the second kind of impossible, something that you thought was impossible, but actually when you, find the, when you look at your assumptions and you find the loophole, you can discover something dramatically new. So it's almost like the second kind is really a pre reflects a prejudice of the one who's uh, interpreting or claiming the impossibility, whereas the first kind might be imposed by nature or in ourself in a certain sense that you really can't accused of being prejudiced, except that it displays certain types of, of phenomena. Is there a third type of impossible that you're aware of? Is that an AI? Uh, 
<laughs> well, maybe some future book will, <laughs> will be about that. But I don't know of one at the moment, at least for my thinking as he, ordinary human scientist thinking. I'm usually trying to decide when someone, I hear the word impossible, my ears pick up and I'm really trying to always imagine, you know, what has the person assumed to make, reach that conclusion? Mm -hmm. And can I am, just imagine there's something different, something different, that some, something that might be altered about that assumption? And if so, why that would be interesting. So almost all the time I'm listening to a talk about any, anything in science, any topic in science, I'm kind of listening with two ears. I'm listening on the one hand for what the person's saying, but I'm always asking myself that question. Uh, what have they assumed? And could it be wrong? And, it, and then could that lead to something interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, the name of our, uh, of our podcast, Into the Impossible, really traces from an Arthur C. Clarke quote, which uh, says something to the effect that the only way to find out what's possible is to venture a little bit into the impossible, which really belies, you know, as you're, as you're saying, this sort of second, this second form of impossibility. I think people really, you know, artificially uh, constrict themselves by, by imposing certain types of biases, et cetera.